Chaz, welcome back to the show. So great, David Lee. What a great day it is today. Is it warm there in the Zen room? It's warm here in the Zen room with uh, the arborists are here today. So I think there's going to be some nice ambient sounds in the background, just like when we eat our food. Yeah, yesterday. I mean, it's never ending in your neighborhood. Never ending. Today, at least, I got to be part of the problem instead of the receiving <laughs> end of the problem. <laughs> um, yeah, that's what it takes to have a beautifully lush and verdant neighborhood i guess yep and everybody has to be doing leaf blowing 24 hours a day in order for this to work um so you and i are recording remotely obviously today but we got to see each other yesterday at least we sure did along with brad ger gerlach what a guy that guy is i mean i spent the day with him how i mean how great is he i mean totally great hey i was thinking about it after you left like brad gerlach coming to the home you guys recording your podcast podcast and leaving and thinking, I don't know that they build them like Brad Gerlach anymore. Like, I know this is such an old man thing to say, and we touched on it briefly yesterday, but that Kanoa Igarashi does not inspire anyone, right? He's not, or does not <laughs> not inspire anybody, but it is not cool, right? Like, I remember, <laughs> of course, in the magazine surf reading days, like seeing pictures of Brad or... You know, even Donovan Frankenreiter and stuff like that, right? Like yeah. these guys had style and they seemed cool. Uh, and maybe, maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe I'm old, but I can't imagine. I mean, nobody's looking at magazines anymore, A. But B, I can't imagine anyone gets on and sees Kanoa Igarashi and says, yes, please. The essence of style. I mean, I think that we're wrong. I agree with you, but I think we're wrong because he has a far greater following than Brad ever did. And if, you know, apparently in Japan, he's a superstar. So I think there's a ton of Japanese kids who are going out and buying gold necklaces. They're wearing whatever shoes Kano is getting, you know, trying to get his sunglasses. He's influencing them. Well, then, yes, I will. And trying fall, to surf like him. Fall on the sword of being old and wrong. But I still feel like you're right. Like deep down, I feel like those kids are going to get blown whatever way the wind blows. So. It'll be Kanoa today and somebody else tomorrow. Whereas Gurr, the way that Gurr would do a turn is still influencing the way that I'm surfing. That's true. And I would, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Is Gurr, Gurr's not really on Instagram, is he? Besides, besides WaveKey. He deleted his, um, yeah, he's Perfect. just WaveKey. It used to be at Brad Gerlach and he would post, because he's funny. He's really yeah, smart. He's really, he's funny. really funny. And so I remember his account was funny and then it just became all business at some point. So, um, but I, there was a meme. I can't, I want to sh share it with you so bad right now, but it's just not appropriate for air. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know how I do this. I guess listeners, if you really want to see it, DM me and I'll send it to you. Um, Perfect. But uh, he sent me, or he posted this meme. I thought that it was him. I'm still certain that it's him. But yesterday I brought it up with him. I'm like, dude, do you remember when you posted this thing? He's like, that wasn't me. I'm like, yeah, I think I'm more, my memory is probably more accurate in this moment than yours is because it, again, influenced me. Like it left this impression and people like gave him a bunch of blowback in the comments section. And uh, so I remember him responding to the, blowback and it was seared into my brain so i know it's him but he just doesn't remember it but uh, i'm so exci yeah. i'm excited to to hear it I, you don't have an image of it anymore you just have the uh, oh yeah i saved I, it I was, oh you do yes <laughs> perfect <laughs> i've got a folder on my phone of saved stuff that i just never go back and look at but i think i need to save it for i don't know what posterity maybe austin will want to see it in 20 years I mean, for this reason right here, it's that one time, that one time that you had the memory that you need to pull it back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and by the way, that meme, it's a sexual joke, which is why I don't feel this is the, the appropriate venue for it. But I still use that joke in my life twice, two or three times a year. A, a situation in real life presents itself where it is the perfect joke. It has to be the right room with the right people in it. But when I deliver it, it's gold every time. How good are you at reading a room like that? Reading the right situation to tell an off-color, let's say, an off-color vignette. Alcohol um, 
is the is the one thing that uh you know uh whatever nullifies my judgment so i'm really good at it in general but i once a year also i have a moment where i drink too much and then i wake <laughs> up in the morning and i'm like oh no what did i say who was in the room how good are you at reading uh, the room oh man i i mean i think i'm pretty good uh but i've realized now that i'm not nearly as good as i think like that because usually I will say if somebody's offended or whatever with me, I'll be like, hey, man, that's on them. That's on them. That person was a weird, you know, thing. That's not my fault. That person was a weird entity in that room. But now I realize, oh, you know, I'm probably just off piste way, just, <laughs> yeah, in the trees all by myself thinking that I'm right on the course. Yeah, well. I've, I guess what I've learned is um, always err on the side of caution. That's that's the lesson that I've taken too is shut your mouth more often than not. Totally. I have the internal um, retarder, you know, restrictor plate where before I deliver whatever the joke is, I do have an internal thing that either says green light or red light. And I've blown past it in the past, but I now know if that thing shows up in my internal dialogue, always veer towards the red light yeah. and, because it's not worth it. And Lauren and I both have one sibling. Uh, we have multiple siblings, but we have one sibling who is that person who just like says what they want blah, 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 and they think they're so... Um, they think they're funny. They think they're, you know, everybody likes them and all that sort of thing. And it's just, everybody knows they're that person and you don't want to be that person. I think I've been that person for huge chunks of my life and always think, but everybody likes that person. But then when you step back a little bit, you realize, no, people actually don't like that person. That person yeah. likes that person, which is great. That person gets to feel like big king or big queen, right? Of the social room. But really, mm. well, it's not more than everybody does or doesn't like, because I guess, should you care whether other people like you? I guess what I see with our siblings is a real limited growth potential for them, a limited um, uh, professional growth, limited in their dating lives, limited in all these different ways that I want them to, uh, you know, excel in. Do, do those siblings partake in ironic racism? Is that part of what they think is enjoyable? Uh, funny that you should say that. Yes, I think they do. <laughs> is there such a thing as ironic racism or is it all just racism? I mean, that's the dang thing is I think I used to think there was such a thing, but as I've gotten older, I realized, nope, it's all just racism. Like, yeah. I, th I think you used to, in a different time, and maybe I'm wrong on this, I would love for a listener to call in and correct me. But I think those kinds of tropes, you could tug on them a little more in the past. And now you absolutely cannot. And it's not just because everybody's more sensitive. I think that's part of it. Everybody is more sensitive. But yeah, like, is it really funny? Is it really funny to joke about, about race? And I'll leave that up to the listener. Yeah. Yeah. That's all we need to say on that. Um, well, hey, it's kind of an interesting organic intro that just happened because today's show has a theme racism <laughs> not far from it it's fighting actually is the theme of today's oh, show <laughs> wanton violence is the theme of today's show and right. this was not mandated by me dictated by me this is just as i'm pulling stories throughout the week and then at the end of the week running them through the filter of what we discuss it's like holy cow look at this theme that's developed there has running been a spike. rampant a spike oh, in surf and surf adjacent violence. Do you know when it all started? I'm going to say, uh, do you have an exact date? I'd have to look up the date, but I know a flashpoint of when it started. And it was when you wrote an article about Kelly slapping Laird. That's really true. World's greatest surfer slaps other world's great or punches other world's greatest surfer in the teeth is when it okay. started. Got it. Oh, so it was not a slap. It was the punch it was in the a punch. Yeah. And in the mouth, so maybe. without question, surf violence has like gone through the roof in the last spike five, five weeks. Yeah. How long? Five weeks since then. Um, so the world's greatest surfers 
apparently written about by the most influential surf outlet because this has influenced lineups around the world. For sure. I mean, it was the most, I think, uh, most read story in Beach Kids history. Uh, millions upon millions of clicks for that thing. So I really did infiltrate. And I wonder if people tacitly felt, well, if this is what the world's two greatest surfers are doing, then I should do this too. This is okay for me to punch my fellow surfer in the mouth. 100% they did. I mean, sociologically or anthropologically or whatever, it's hard to track exact uh, cause and effect with societies. But here here it's crystal freaking clear. It's insane. I think there was a bunch of precursors, you know, COVID making a bunch of, uh, creating a bunch of new surfers in the lineup, COVID prohibiting core surfers from being able to surf during that time. So when we all went back in the water, there's more uh, variety of crafts in the water now than there's ever been. But your article is what the flashpoint was. I mean, this was a room filled with uh, hydrogen gas, right? And then Kelly punching Laird was the spark that boom, blew it up. Boom. Um, Well, Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, Laird. By the way, where did yeah, that fight fun. go? What other what other um, violent acts took place in the subsequent five weeks on Beach Grit other than Kelly punching Laird in the teeth? Was there a choke? I mean, uh, there was a choke. There was a, I think I tried to get a rear naked choke in there at some point. I realized the more specific they got, the like people have to have the visceral, oh, punch in mouth. Like yes. that stuff works, right? The more specific I got into... I think karate chop neck. I did one. Uh, <laughs> the, the more specific they got, people didn't like it as much. I've learned this with barrel or not, strangely, is that the more specific I give, the funnier it is. And the more kind of talking points we have, like among the best ever were, you know, bringing a parrot to a protest. Yeah. <laughs> a gu- guitarist sidling up to secondary lead guitarist sidling up to a secondary guitar with their back and like playing and <laughs> playing with one another and looking at it. like that those are the highlight barrel or nas in our yeah pantheon. it's really true and then if i just give you a vague one like oh you know um wearing jumping bracelets. on a trampoline yeah yeah exactly then then it's kind of we still could talk about it and still interesting and relevant to what what's going on in surf culture but taking a parrot to a protest much yeah. more interesting <laughs> Totally. Totally. It turns out very barrel. Um, (laughs) So anyways, two days ago, I mean, so when I walked into your backyard, you presented me with this story yesterday. Uh, Joel Tudor Tudor brutally assaulted in the lineup as enraged stand-up paddleboarder appears to repeatedly swing deadly oar at surf champions torso, knees, and buttocks. I was really happy to bring back buttocks and as is my way, I will keep hammering on the buttocks because calling the butt or the ass or whatever your preferred nomenclature is, calling it the buttocks is, I think, like real prime territory right now. I think it's underused and I think it's time to bring back kind of the polite, uh, descriptive buttocks. I think you're very right, but I would also challenge you and maybe even raise you with butthole. Yeah, I mean, butthole is what a person is. The stand-up paddler in this case was a butthole for (laughs) paddling Joel Tudor on his buttocks. But it could have been a funnier headline even. I mean, we could debate which is funnier, but if it said that he paddled Joel Tudor on the butthole with the (laughs) the one. (laughs) You got a a good point. Paddled him? I mean, let me just reread the thing. Uh, brutally assaulted in the lineup as enraged stand-up paddleboarder appears to repeatedly swing deadly or at surf champions torso, knees, and butthole. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. It's funnier. It's way funnier. It's less of, it's, you're right though about like, it's less gentlemanly. I mean, the, it's a little the, more crass. But it's way funnier. It is way funnier. But this, back to this story, I was shocked that this thing did not take off a lot more. I mean, it had a nice run on Beach Grit, but I thought this thing was going to be a highlight story because rarely do you have an assault actually captured on video, right? I mean, usually yeah. it's some like, you know, the foil point guy, I think there was video of him or a picture at least of the one that happened in San Francisco of him throwing the rock at the foil, right? 
Yeah. And then of course you have uh, only pictures or was it video of the Andy Malibu lion? One? That's yeah. video, video. Okay. So, so some video, but you don't have the incident. Oh, you do have the incident. Wait, do you on that one? Um, yes, you do. You have him. You just don't have. So I guess there's video. This well, one, no, though, the, no, there wasn't. The Andy Lyon thing, there wasn't an assault. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. This yeah. is just a banging rails and then kicking off the wave. This is the guy hitting Joel with an oar. That's the assault. Yeah. I mean, and literally, like the, so for those who haven't seen it, you can go on to Beach Grit or go to Joel Tudor's Instagram. The scene plays out in Cardiff by the Sea, Cardiff Main Break, which is a good bumper sticker that I see on a car here that said something. Oh man, I can't even remember now. It's something with a supper crossed out and it's oh carter free good thing gone bad oh uh, yeah yeah but anyhow uh so this uh, it's a small day and there's a clear left right supper paddles tries to go paddles on what he thinks i guess is the peak of the right trying to go right joel is on the left goes left crosses the sub's tail and then the sub starts swinging his oar at him and looks like he makes some contact and then as joel's paddling back out Supper on his knees, on his steed, is stroking out, swinging and hitting Joel on the butt with his paddle, which I thought this is so absurdly hilarious. A, the fact, I mean, a lot of talking points here. Joel Tudor, for those who don't know, is a martial arts master, black belt, I do believe, in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And world champ. World champ. And world champion surfer. So I don't know how like you would think he would be well within his rights, even the police and whatnot would say, well, you were hitting him with a paddle, right? Like he has a right to choke you out in the water. Uh, but Joel appears to do nothing and posts it on his Instagram with just the Cardiff, Cardiff during summer is special or something, uh, but didn't appear. And Joel is not, I don't think typically known to be a guy without temper, right? I think Joel Tudor gets aggrieved and, gets frustrated and shares his frustration regularly. There are stories of him, uh, you know, whacking people in the lineup himself at Cardo. And so anyhow, I thought this is a perfect, it's so absurd, A, this is a perfect little storm. And people were like, that's not assault. He barely touched him and things like that, right? In the comments where I was like, are you kidding me? This is absolute gold. How do you not see him on his knees, reaching out, trying to gent or try hit, Joel's literal buttocks or butthole with his paddle was the best thing that happened all year. And I don't well, know why other people didn't think so. In the world of you and in your and my reality and world, we would never call that an assault. You got slapped by Ash. You got slapped by Ashton Goggins in a public venue on video. We never referred to that as assault. But in the modern world that we live in, that's way more of an assault than anything that people actually go to the police for on a regular basis. So yes, you're entirely right. The fact that the commentary on your Instagram goes, there was a guy who said, where's the assault? You yeah. Know, as, and I'm like, first of all, do you even know who you're following on Instagram? <laughs> like Chaz writing the word assault in the headline almost ensures that it's metaphorical. It almost ensures there's no assault. So the fact that there was a swing of an oar and it made contact and again, in the real world that we're living in now, this litigious whatever world, yes, that is an assault. The police would absolutely deem that an assault. Well, um, sure, he swung a weapon. I mean, what would be deemed a weapon at somebody and made for all apparent, like on video, made contact. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, so the other detail here is that Joel exercised extreme restraint. Like I would have thought Joel would have, I mean, choked the dude out right there or taken him to the beach and choked him out. It's really uh, kind of amazing, Here, impressive. Here's the thing. You, I feel uh, a great kinship to Joel Tudor over this incident uh, because, are you there? Did you freeze? Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. I'm here. Okay. Uh, for this reason, right? The Back to the Ashton incident, when Ashton slapped me at Surf Expo, right? Yep. I still get a lot of guff of people saying, you are a big sissy. You should have gone and punched him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, if I would have done that, the whole story would not have been funny anymore. And I couldn't have written article and article and article and article about it, right? It would have been 
a bad look for both of us. Uh, it would have been super awkward. The worse I pounded Ashton, the more awkward it would have gotten. I could, I honestly couldn't have mentioned it. It would have just been a thing that happened that we don't discuss, right? I've gotten so much mileage out of that by not doing anything where for something to be funny, you can't be the big hero tough guy at the end, right? Because that's not right. funny anymore. That's deeply embarrassing to Ashton and that kind of stuff is not funny. I think Joel knew this was comedy gold. And if he would have gone and choked the guy out, uh, it, nothing would have been as funny about it. Like where I don't understand why other people don't think this Tudor thing is comedy gold, but I think Joel in the moment knew this is absolutely priceless. If I react or do something, it becomes not funny anymore. Well, we're cutting straight into barrel or not right now, because my first barrel and offer today was going to be about exercising restraint based on this Joel Tudor incident. Um, because last week you told the story of screaming in the face of an old woman. You sure. know what I mean? And bad look. it's a bad look. And you're right. Everybody feels gross. Even people listening to that felt gross. And sure. if you would have got into a fight with Ashton, you just gave the example of if I would have pounded him, you know, to no end, it doesn't matter. Even if he fought back, even if it was an equal fight, even yeah. no matter how that fight goes, as soon as there's an actual like fight that's taking place, it, it just feels stomachs. gross. It yeah. turns people's stomachs. It doesn't feel great. Nobody feels good about it. It, you know, Sully's, um, uh, uh, the venue, like Surf Expo and all that sort of stuff. So you're entirely right. Just letting it happen, taking the higher ground, if there is higher ground here to take, does certainly make it more funny. But it also, um, there's another detail that is sometimes people are so absurdly in the wrong that having an argument about them, why they're in the wrong, makes you look absurd as well. Sure. You know, I and, mean, and so talking about our two siblings, Lauren and my siblings, um, who will remain unnamed, and we have lots of siblings. So anybody who knows us will have to try to guess which one we're talking about. Um, we find ourselves engaged in debates with them, and we have to back out of it and just be like, hey, honey, what are you doing? Yeah. Why would you ever engage in that? Like, let them think that they're right. It's trying, it's, you know, the sky's blue and they're trying to tell you that it's red or something. You wouldn't, you would never try to convince them that it's blue. You would just think that person's crazy. Weird. I wonder why yeah. they're crazy. And you'd move on <laughs> yeah. with your life. You wouldn't actually take the time to explain why it's blue, you know? I mean, this is the, the smartest people who I try to bait uh, into internet wars. That's why they are the smartest ones are always silent, right? Like, if you that's why down, Ashton's been silent for the last four years. Totally. If you come down and play with me down there, I guarantee I will win, right? Like, there's, I will win by losing. I will win by winning. I will win any which way. If you engage me, I will win, right? And so, with well, it's the, your currency. Sure, but with the like the swell net thing, right? When Stu Nettle came on for this is an old story, Beach Grit, or not that old, but. Uh, Stu Nettle got mad that I was, who is Swellnut, for those who don't know, Australia's, I think, kind of answer to Surfline, right? Sure. I think so. I, I think it's like smaller than Surfline significantly, but I think, you know, they have wave cameras and they have a, like a community that talks on oh, forums and whatnot, right? They hired Long Tom. So anybody who wants to go read Long Tom report coverage, head over to Swellnut. In any case, uh, I was making fun of them for gently, lightly making fun for getting called out by the Australian government for having voyeuristic or putting cameras where they didn't have permission and calling them voyeurs and alluding to them as creepy and voyeuristic, right? Stu Nettle, I think Surf Swellnet's uh, editor, I don't know what he is exactly, founder, head, um, got into Beach Grit's comments and tried to shame me by saying that, uh, you know, whatever, we have permission to do these things. And oh, by the way, your partner approached us last year wanting to get, you know, combined beach grit with Swellnet and didn't tell you. So he's out sort of, you know, trying to make me look dumb by Derek's out cheating, trying to hook up with us while you're making fun of us, jokes on you, which just gave me all the ammunition in the world to go after Swellnet for another however long, right? Where right. if he would have said nothing, the story would have died. Right, yeah, entirely. He came over to play with the pigs in the mud and exactly. then was wondering why he got dirty. Yep. And was just sitting yeah. there thinking, oh man. Yeah. But well, they people don't, should play. 
Well, and they don't realize, again, their currency is uh, t- doing surf reports and trying to tell these stories and whatever else. Your currency is just poking fun and being irreverent about everything that is surfing. And so why would they come over and get offended by any of it and then expect to not be talked about after the fact, you know? Real, it's real lonely I think by it, myself all the time. Well, I think about it. Um, somebody was pissed about something last week. I forget what it was. Anyways, they sent me a DM. I'm not really on Instagram that much. So it took me three or four days to actually read it. And what ended up happening was after they went to sleep that night, they woke up in the morning and they sent me a follow-up DM and was like, hey, I'm sorry that I sent that. <laughs> I was angry last night. I'm not angry anymore. I apologize. <laughs> And then I also have another DM saying how much they loved that episode and they thought it was the funniest episode ever. So anyways, um, the thing that he was upset about, I remember thinking, you know, I take it. I take the feedback with a grain of salt, but I take it and I assess, okay, what does he really mean here? Can we adjust in a certain way to try to uh, accommodate, you know, him and whoever else? And what it was, was you're writing and doing a bunch of irreverent stuff, right? And people don't like that, or people get offended by it for whatever reason. They find something to get to take offense with. But my answer is, it's all it all should be irreverent. Like surfing, the fact that anybody takes surfing that seriously, which I do often, is kind of absurd. And so we need not not all of us, but we do need people in the surf space who remind and find the humor in taking it so seriously. I mean, that's what I think. That, and I'm glad that not everybody does to fill that role, right? Like somebody needs to take it seriously so I can joke. Like mm-hmm. if I didn't have the World Surf League taking it ultra seriously and trying to create this thing, then there would be no joke, right? If World Surf League was joking too, like no, 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 surf, pro surfing, get it? <laughs> right. And there, there'd be no room for me. Well, and yeah, uh, like Brad and I yesterday, what we did, it was very serious. We talked about very serious things. But also in surfing, it's super fun and it's, you can mock one another while, you know, so there's moments, there's a lot of different facets to the personality of surfing and they're all relevant. Anyways, the uh, comment on Beach Grit that I loved about the Joel story was, um, let me see what (laughs) this person's name is. White folks with dreads are funny. (laughs) Is there nice? Good, good. It's all one. That's all one word. Um, anyways, the comment was choosing between a sweeper or tutor is almost as hard as choosing between maroon five or cold play. It's a lose, lose proposition. It's an, I thought that was a very apt comment. Uh, I personally am a fan of Joel cause I think he brings great entertainment, which at the end of the day, we all want to be entertained, right? Uh, partially by surfing at least. And I think Joel and whether you like or dislike his disposition, he's entertaining and good yeah. on him for that. But the Maroon 5 Coldplay uh, analogy, as apt as they come in terms of really can't pick one or the other. I, I mean, I pick Coldplay. I hate to say it. I, mean, I hate to say it, but Coldplay is Joel in this scenario to me where it's kind of like, I get it. I get why they made fun of, why they're made fun of. And there's tons of poppy music of theirs that's terrible, but there's some freaking great music that they've made too. Some bangers, some cold, deep cut cold play bangers. But there really the, are. Back to the sweeper, though. Like, well, I guess we can move on from the story. I guess we've okay. exhausted it because there's more surf fights that we need to get there's, to. Yeah. Police on high alert in La Jolla after spike in wantonly violent surf altercations at Wind and Sea. Quote, punches thrown and a surfer held underwater for what he estimated to be 30 seconds. Uh, like, this one to me is <laughs> one like, come on, because. Uh, okay, so I get it, right? Like, wind and sea can get violent, but, or I don't know that it can get violent. It's a localized spot, even though the wave isn't great. And, you know, you could, whatever, all that stuff is what it is. But wind and sea can get localized. So this guy, who, what he estimated to be 30 seconds underwater, went to the cops, right? He got surf in a surf fight and went to the cops. Can you imagine? going to the cops for a surf fight unless somebody like paddled out with a knife and started like aggressively slashing at people for no reason and the what it would take for me to i mean i guess in general what it would take for me to go to the police but this guy surfing at wind and sea 
full on had to be a beginning coup, right? To get out of the water after your surf fight and say, I'm so shook up by this. I must go to the police to exact like retribution on the person who shamed me in the lineup or hurt me in the lineup. Like I get going to the police to prevent uh, kind of somebody else from getting hurt maybe is something, but for sure this person wasn't doing that. They were going to the police because you were out of line, Mr. Superman. But well, come what on. about the what about the attempted drowning part? Like holding somebody under the water, I highly doubt it was 30 seconds. Being held under for eight eight seconds would feel like 30 seconds. But I mean, I guess the length of time does matter because if he just got dunked, that's not a there's problem. No, there's but if no he got way held he down held... for 30 seconds, I'd be like, that's different. I don't mind throwing punches and figuring out who's like the better fighter. And then once one person is bested, you have to like, you know, the the puncher has to acquiesce. I'm like, okay, I won the fight. But dunking somebody and holding them down is kind of, that's a boundary. There's absolutely no way that like 30 seconds in the middle of a fight would drown you, right? Like you're all hyped up and, yeah, you know, it's not like you're calm and steady and whatnot. If somebody dunked your head for 30 seconds on the water, like that's why this guy got dunked. A head dunk is a thing that happens in surf fights. I would, wouldn't do that or wouldn't want it done to me, but if it happens, it happens, right? Uh, this guy was not trying to kill him. I mean, if he could prove this guy was honestly trying to kill me, he was trying to drown me and kill me. Uh, but let's be honest, that wasn't happening. It was some stinking COVID surfer coming in who doesn't know anything, got roughed up and ran to the police. Like that's what the, I mean, I think the police was, policeman even said, or was interviewed was like, this stuff happens at Wind and Sea a lot. We know we're aware of it. Uh, but this guy came to the place. And so now we actually have to step up surveillance, like screw this guy. Well, I thought you were about to reveal a story of dunking an old woman at some point. I mean, man, <laughs> see, thankfully, um, thankfully, I'm older and wiser. Greatest surfer of all time, Kelly Slater, advocates for the return of guys getting kicked out of the water, fins broken out, slaps in the head as world's highest, most high profile way descends into chaos. So this was a story that Derek wrote, which was about Kelly Slater's final episode of the series that Outer Known has produced and published on the WSL's YouTube channel. It's called Lost Tapes. And the final episode is about Pipeline. And so Kelly says, quote, my biggest goal was to have a prominent spot in the lineup at Pipeline. I've never felt like I've deserved a wave out there. There was a hierarchy and you didn't just break into it. Nowadays, you go out there and it's four to it's four foot and there's 60 guys. When I was a kid out there, you really had to put in your time. Guys were getting kicked out of the water, fins broken. Guys were getting slapped in the head. I kind of wish that that hierarchy, the Phil Perry's of the world, the Perry Danes, the Johnny boys would come back and sort that lineup out, end quote. I mean, which is, I, I'm with Kelly, like, but calling for violence. And of course, as we all know, Johnny Boy Gomes, even violence against women, like, uh, it's not something that I think is Kelly would say lightly, but it's true. Like those places used to be, people don't regulate themselves, right? Like you open somewhere up and people will fill it and take advantage. Nobody's going to stand there and say, Hey, everybody, let's, you know, we're going to wreck this thing. If we all are here at one time, let's sort out some kind of system where, et cetera, et cetera, that people don't do that. Right. Now in the day and age, I think where surf violence is prosecuted and where people go to the police with assault and charges so readily and all this kind of stuff, a place like Pipeline, you know, what are you going to do? Like if who's going to, who's going to go swing a fist at Pipeline anymore and risk going to jail? Well, I think Kelly might've um, maybe more accurately should have stated he wishes that we could go back in time to that time because nobody could regulate that lineup now. It's just a different no. time. It's unregulatable to a large degree. Uh, like we've talked about Malibu in the past. And I think what happened with society in that time was, um, you know, the Perry Danes of the world, Dane Kialoa, like they earned respect first 
not only through their surfing ability, but for their stature in the community. Like these were respected figures. And so that's why they became the enforcers. They took that seriously, that they're now a respected figure in the community. And so they then uh, informed the youth on what's the appropriate way to behave in society. But things diverted at a certain point. And Johnny Boy turns out to be a uh, sadly, an infamous example of this, where he's a good surfer, but he hasn't earned the respect societally to become the person who lays down the law for everybody else. He's laying down the law because he's respected in this thing that is surfing and because he happens to be stronger and more macho than anybody else. But do you really want him being the one who teaches your children etiquette. And that's the question I was asking about Andy Lyon in the last couple of weeks was, yeah, I'm glad somebody's doing it. I'm just not convinced he's the right guy. And it turns out the more that I listen to him talk, he proves that he's not the right guy. And so if we, as a the current group of surfers in society, give the keys to him and let him, or give the paddle to him and let him be the enforcer, then we're actually wrong. You know what I mean? Now the onus is on us if we're co-signing that. So Kelly gave the examples of Phil Perry and Perry Dane should have stopped there. Once he says, and Johnny boy, it's like, well, I don't know, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Might have wanted I mean, to have left that one out. Yeah, I mean, yes, I totally hear what you're saying. And, you know, but whatever, we, we got what we got these days, I suppose. I'll take an Andy Lyon still trying. Uh, and of course, he's not going to be able to try much harder. I mean, who knows if, oh, I guess that guy didn't go to the police in that case, but whoever was the enforcer, quote, end quote, at Windensee, that guy, you know, now there's an assault charge against him. That guy is not going to be able to do what he wants to do, whether he was right or wrong in that case, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. Just the people who gained respect with this whole life of being respect, uh, I don't know, yeah, exuding respect, right? It's not just about what you do in the water. I mean, you said it already, but people don't respect that anymore either. Like you could have a stinking Duke Kahanamoku out at Pipeline and there would be some punk who just thought, this is my time, I want mine now and wouldn't respect the Duke. But because society respects Duke, there would probably be a bunch of other people who stood up for Duke so that he wouldn't have to say a word, you yeah. know, and they would put that young buck in check. Hopefully. Well, all of this has brought us to everyone's favorite new segment of the podcast. I love yeah. that we have an intro song. We do. The segment was called Trust in We, but the guy who sent in the music got it, <laughs> rebranded it to Trust in Us. So, so um, I mean, some of the some of the best little changes just happen accidentally like that. I mean, it does rhyme, obviously, but Trust in We just sounds funnier to me. What what should we yeah. make? I mean, now that we have a song, it's got to be Trust in Us. Okay, Trust in Us, it is. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think that that came from Mitch Robinson, who runs the. Tales from the Cobblestones podcast. Fantastic. Uh, I apologize if I credited that incorrectly, but he just sent that through after our show two weeks ago. The next day I woke up, had an email from him, and boom, we got a theme song. Who who brings us this segment, David Lee Scales? Son, boom, baby, because the thing is, who do you trust nowadays? You got to be wary. You really got to vet your sources. Uh, you never know. We've all been burned, literally, in the water, maybe sunburned. And figuratively, of course, we've been burned. So this is where Chaz and I, we are here for you to guide you. Fashion advice, romantic advice. Don't you think, Chaz, that we have earned our audience's trust? Just like Perry Dane earned the respect of the Pipeline lineup, I think life advice here, 100% it's correct. You can go to the bank with what is uttered. If our audience is the equivalent of the lineup in Pipeline, the podcast audience, then we are the Perry Danes of the podcast yep. world. Yep. Um, so trust in us 
And of course, you can trust the bum. Chaz and I put our full faith and trust in Sunbum to protect ourselves and our children. And so and the earth um, and the reef. And the earth and the reef. And so sunbum.com, you can use promo code surf splendor once and save 15%. So that's what I would encourage you doing. Going and stock up on the mineral sunscreens. That's what we use. Uh, and they have a bunch of different applicators for it, like roll-on applicators, spray, face stick, lotions. They also have sun, or I'm sorry, skincare products. So beyond sun care, they have like lotion. They have hair care product. They have moisturizer. They have everything you possibly need on sunbum.com. And nifty containers packaging too. Their branding is great. It'll look good in your home. People will be impressed when they come over to sunscreen up or shower or bathe or any of it. Yeah. So and I saw some product. I saw it at Target this week. Um, so you could buy it at Target, you could buy it at CVS. I think Sephora maybe even carries it. You could buy it all over the place, but support local surf shops if you'd like because they carry it as well. You can get it anywhere or get it, save the 15% on sunbum.com. That promo code is surf splendor, all one word. Anyways. Here's the thing where people need to, they need advice. Mitch Kaufman posted a dramatic photo of the incident that happened in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, mm-hmm. where- It was a, a f- dynamic photo. It really was. Kudos to the photographer. I don't know if the photographer got enough yes. credit here, but here's the scenario. It's a photo of a guy on a surfboard going left, holding his hands out to block because he's on a wave and there's a foiler on a wave getting ejected from his foil, following. And the foil is out of the water, aimed directly at the surfer who's using his hands to hopefully block the oncoming um, machete yeah, machine, that, yeah. is, that is the foil. So Mitch Kaufman posted this dramatic photo of the incident on Instagram. And he said, foils and SUPs are cool, but they don't belong in crowded lineups like the Jack's Beach Pier. The surfer was injured yesterday with the foil smashing his face. I know the ocean belongs to everyone, but safety first. Feel free to share this. So Chaz, the audience needs to know. We are all living in an inclusive world. Everyone is welcome, but should foilers be welcomed into surf lineups? Never, ever, ever, ever. Not one time. No, no matter how good you are, there's no reason or time for it if you're very good at foiling if you are an expert foiler and don't fall people see you out there and think oh i can do that too right and so you're encouraging bad behavior like i mean this picture i think was absolutely egregious the foiler was a clear kook uh thinking i'm gonna go get mine i want to go foil today this is where i'm going and went and hurt somebody because he's a dumbass right like Foils do not belong anywhere near people. Uh, I fully agree with you and you're entirely correct. And the reason, the detail here is that that foiler is a kook and he doesn't know where to foil. So different waves call for different kind of best riding equipment. And the foil does not need to be at a dumpy beach break. In fact, it nullifies the point of the foil. And We do know some of the best foilers in the world, as it turns out. One of them is John John Florence. Look at any image of John John on a foil ever. You won't even see a wave breaking. It's just lulls in the ocean. I interviewed um, the Hurley, Jeff Hurley and Ryan Hurley, uh, I don't know, a month ago or something. And they have a foil company now. Yeah, they have West Coast Foil Club. It's not like an actual company, but it is like a group and it's a, you know, I don't know what, yeah, I guess a group, kind of a brand that they've created that doesn't sell anything, but just to get together and foil. Anyways, they're very good at it. And they're like, no, you never need to be anywhere near another surfer. That is the value of the foil is that you get away from everybody else. So in this specific uh, photo and incident, the foiler was entirely wrong. And to answer my question, should foilers be welcomed into surf lineups? No. Welcome in the ocean not in surf lineups. Exactly. I mean, again, you said it, but it defeats the purpose of foiling. Uh, Yesterday, just so happened, walking on the beach, there's no waves down here today. But yeah, where'd you and Brad surf yesterday, speaking of? Carlsbad, and it was freaking Mm. tiny. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really small. So walking on the beach, 
uh, saw Foiler coming down the stairs to, to go, presumably, to paddle out at Swami's. I almost went over and talked to him, but then I thought, maybe he's not. I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. I didn't stay and watch, but I was hoping. Even though it was tiny, you know, there were still a couple people in the lineup at Swami's. And if that friggin' kook paddled out at Swami's, you don't do it, man. And I was, I was going to give him benefit that he was going to paddle out past Boneyards and out to sea. Deserves to be shamed. Uh, yep. Well, Kelly Slater, turns out, chimed in on this one as well. So he said, quote, zero reason why foilers need to surf near paddle surfers, especially newbies. Bums me out to see lots of kooks on foils getting way too comfy around other people before they can ride the things with elite skill enough to avoid hitting people, end quote. So Kelly completely agrees with you, Chaz, and I'm just curious how that makes you feel. Does that make you want to change your opinion? No, I agree, I agree with Kelly Slater, world's greatest surfer, a lot. Uh, I agree with him about Pipeline, agree with him here. I'll agree with Kelly, oddly enough, more often than I do not. Look at that. In this show that's all about surf violence, we're bringing people together. I mean, that's what we do, really, at the end of the day. But that is also true that, like, most of Kelly's, not Kelly's opinions across the board, I always find uh, well reasoned. I will say. And I think people laugh, you know, when Kelly says like, I'm not a whatever, epistemy uh, or whatever, disease expert, whatever yeah, he says. Yeah. Uh, like, I think it is funny and stuff. And obviously he's not. And obviously Kelly can be, I don't know, full of Kelly. Uh, but I think he is generally well-reasoned, whether you agree or disagree. Yeah. Well, I agree as well. And that is why you can trust in us and you can trust the bum of course to protect you and your family go to sunbum.com to not only load up but also to support our work when you use that promo code that lets them know that you heard about them here and um, you need sunblock you need skin care you need hair care why not get it through sunbum.com beautiful so beautiful um the other huge fight in the surf world that's taking place right now is actually a title fight this is between vans and the wsl it is vans having coming for in who, hot for those who do not know uh the pipeline masters is a specific event that happens mid to late december it does not happen in january so when the World Surf League decided to flip the schedule and start with Pipeline in January, they lost, that's why it has to be the Pipeline Pro for those who don't know, it cannot be the Pipeline Masters. So Vans reimagining with Stab Magazine what a new Pipeline Masters should be. So this year there's going to be a new Pipeline Masters, which oddly is going to be an air show. <laughs> Apparently. Who um, would have ever thought? Not I. And I don't know that that'll actually play out that way. I think they're using I mean, that's, that's that concept the way for they, marketing. I fully sold it that way, which seems like a bizarre way to sell. Like to me, Pipeline is one of the three waves on tour that doesn't need to be sold. It's Pipeline, right? Like you don't need to change how people ride it. I think what makes it interesting and what I suppose will be interesting about this contest is who you invite, right? Like the who surfs pipeline can be interesting and different formats of people surfing. The fact that they put front and center, we're turning it into an air show and we want to see people boosting off that end section. Freaking cares about that. That is like the dumbest. Uh, that was such a miss. I mean, I'll say Stab has been doing some good work, right? Uh, and rarely do they have a, or rarely lately have they had just a full on miss. That to me was an absolute swing and a miss. Well, do you think, um, that the writer just got carried away with pushing that narrative. Like I know that the concept was we've got an opportunity here to reimagine what the pipe masters could be. And they took all the criticisms that we've all kind of leveled for the last couple of years, which is there's too many surfers. Um, the contest format is too restrictive. It doesn't actually allow for the best surfer necessarily to win a given event or a given heat. Even there's too much, 
bureauc bureaucratic kind of red tape everywhere. So let's re-envision the whole thing. So they re-envisioned the format. They re-envisioned that, uh, you know, other things can be scored on this wave other than just the barrel. But I feel like the writer maybe got carried away and led with that. And then they used imagery of Nate, you know, Nate Fletcher doing a huge air and all this other stuff. And that kind of became the focus of the article. When it actually plays out the day of the event and in the judging booth, I cannot imagine that they're going to give somebody who does a massive air an equal score to somebody who gets a massive cannon of a barrel. To me, I've been in plenty of surf room uh, spitball sessions, surfing magazine, at stab back in the day. This seems like it's fully, uh, they want to turn it into an, or they want the air to be a big thing. They want people to be going for it. And so I think, I don't think that was a writer getting carried away. I think that was the focus of the thing. I think they thought, let's reimagine. People only think of pipe as a barrel. What if we, you know, like to me, that's, like, and everybody, everybody in the room got carried away. Yeah, yeah. Remembering, you know, Nathan Fl uh, Fletcher, of course, is a Vans athlete. And so, you know, I play, I'm sure Vans likes that and all that. But it's it seemed like a real miss. It seems like an absolute miss and something they are going to be pushing, I bet, on the day of the event. And we'll be scoring high. But we're going to see big alley-oops and stuff out of barrels. And they're going to think, yay. And I think that's fine but that's not what you want to see at pipe you want to see it you want it to be like the nuance of pipe may be boring to somebody who doesn't watch much pro surfing right like an air is easy to understand you see somebody go high or somebody spin fast and you can think oh high fast right like somebody weaving no hands backside through the tube versus somebody in kind of a crouched pig dog somebody a little bit deeper, a little bit less deep, somebody coming out after the spit or with the spit. Like these things I think are hard or more difficult for the non-informed viewer to pick up which is better or which is worse. Uh, so again, I think it's a, I think it's a gaff. I think the subtle fine taste of pipeline is how people ride the barrel. Without a question, I don't necessarily agree that people don't understand or wouldn't it be, uh, you know, in awe of somebody getting disappearing on a ten foot wave at pipe and getting blown out? I think that's actually totally relatable, no matter but if I think you've never seen the versus, ocean. Versus somebody slightly deeper or slightly less deep, I think that's right. everything for us, right? At pipe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Where I think the average surfer sees, oh, these. Well, I don't get the difference. <laughs> They're all in the barrel. Here's what I will argue: is that talk to anybody who can do the full rotation air and can also get barreled at pipe. So John John Florence, Mason Ho, Jamie O'Brien, Eli Hanneman, they can do both things at that specific venue. Every single one of them, if you asked, what would you rather do? What's actually a more, I don't know, thrilling thing in surfing? They will all say that the 10 foot stand-up barrel is the pinnacle of surfing. And then they'll say, yeah, the air, the full road at the end section is also killer. And if you can do both of them, that's kind of awesome. But there's nothing that eclipses the stand-up barrel. Yep. I mean, again, I will say stab gaffed on this. I'll be uh, interested to see as it goes, because I bet they're going to be pushing it. My money's on. They will be pushing it in the booth. They will be pushing it to the surfers ahead of time, like in the meetings of how they're going to score this, et cetera. They're going to tell the surfers, hey, go get barreled. But we want to see airs at the end. And so we're going to see a bunch of airs at the end. Well, so we'll see what plays out with that. But as far as the format goes, they have reimagined reimagined it. And um, just to let the listeners know, there's three preliminary rounds uh, where the surfers surf in all three rounds and there's no elimination. So they're 30 minute heats. This means that each surfer gets 90 minutes in the water before anything before anyone gets eliminated. And it's a leaderboard scoring format throughout the entire event. So it's not like you have to win your heat. It's that your two best waves from the entire event are what actually end up in your score line. So this is similar to what we've seen at Surf Ranch. This is similar to what we've seen in some of the big wave events. The idea being you can completely get skunked in a heat or you could just completely like uh, underperform in a heat and it's not going to be the end of your contest. You just want to score 
two great rides, the two best rides throughout the entire event. And um, so I think this is interesting. I think like the format that they've designed, I think there's, so it's four person heats, by the way, I think they're overlapping heats and there's also no priority within a heat. And I think what they've designed here is a step more towards a free surf session. And it's a more a step towards let's find out who the best surfer is on a given swell, not necessarily in a given heat, not necessarily just against this one other surfer. This allows for surfers on opposite ends of the draw to still be competing against one another. And it's giving us, giving them enough surfing time in the water to, you know, get two rides regardless, two good rides, regardless of what the conditions are doing. I'll be excited to see how, what fan responses the, for me and my money, uh, the street leagues, professional skateboarding does a sort of similar thing to this where you have for your, uh, what I guess, prelim heats or whatever, not there's finals day. And then there's the whatever qualifiers, uh, they have, I don't know, between three and four, maybe different heats, right. Where I think, I don't know, five or six skaters in each one where you're not skating against the people there. You're just skating for to get on the leaderboard to get into finals day where gotcha. to me that that format is all fine but it completely again for me uh takes the tension out of that first day where you kind of watch it passively like eh, okay you know like whatever like if somebody does something good then you get excited or people cheer but otherwise it seems like you know there's there's not much reason to get invested uh until you get to the final day which well, I wonder here if these first three days will be, people will be uh, kind of cool, but they won't be watching it all day. They'll like, you know, you watch the typical format. And again, I think there's a lot wrong with the World Surf League format. And I'm happy that Vans and Stav are taking a different angle. I'll be curious to see how it goes. But I think it lessens your reason to watch all day and increases your reason to watch the highlight package at the end of the day. I think you're right in the street league example, because the primary tension is between the competitors. It's who's going to win this event. The primary tension at pipeline is pipeline versus it's man versus nature. And so I think that it's compelling enough to watch on its own as things get pointier and it becomes a race between number one, two, and three. That's also interesting, but it's always going to be secondary towards man versus nature. I think so. But I think in terms of, again, just keeping eyeballs fixed, if I'm watching something like this, some format where the, the guys are going for their, you know, whatever, for their best two waves over a period of days. Uh, and I look at the heat format and I see, oh, you know, I'm watching this one now, John, John and whoever and Jeremy Flores and whoever are coming up in the next seat. That's a pretty banging heat, but I got something to do. I'll catch it later. Right. If I, if it's, John John is coming up against Jeremy Florence at the next heat and winner goes home, then I'm for sure going to watch it because I can't, you know, I can't see the highlight later. Like catching yeah. the, like to me, sudden death elimination, uh, while not the best in all things, is maybe the best in for surfing. And I get that, you know, it could be John John Flores or John John, John Flores, John John Florence versus Jeremy Flores. Uh, and the waves go totally flat and you miss this banger heat, theoretical heat, because the surf goes flat and that's a bummer, you know, which yeah. I suppose Van Stab is trying to fix. Uh, I still think that single elimination, sudden death is more exciting, even, in, even if the ocean doesn't cooperate. Well, I started out by saying that this is actually a title bout between the WSL and Vans. And what I mean by that is, um, the WSL has painted themselves into a corner a bit by making their contest format so restrictive. It oftentimes nullifies the best surfers in the world. We saw that a lot when they're running in beach breaks last year, or even this, this year, Portugal and stuff like that. Um, so what we have repeatedly stated over and over is we just want to see the best surfers in the best waves in the world. And the WSL has given us that twice this year, maybe three times if you count sunset, but out of however many nine events or whatever we sat through pipe Chopu and maybe sunset were actually some of the best surfers Bangers. in the world in the best waves. Right. And so they have all these other goals other than the, that 
and they're often servicing those goals. And you and I have to sit through more often than not events that aren't giving us what we want. So it leaves total open room for people to come in and give us what we want and to rethink because they're not beholden to all this structure, this archaic structure. And so this is where I think Vans is coming out swinging. And Stab has already laid some groundwork here, by the way, because they've done uh, Surf 100, they've done Stab High, both of those things, rethink everything. And by the way, give much more objective focus to a specific thing. Like here's an objective criteria for this specific thing that we want to see with stab high it's airs, but then give a much broader telling of the story. So it's like, here's exactly what we want and let's tell multiple stories in this broad way. And it's super compelling viewing. Whereas the world surf league tells a very narrow story of a very broad kind of very subjective focus, you know? To me, uh, the a sub story here, I totally agree with you, but the sub story here is the position, position of weakness that the World Surf League is clearly in is the fact that not only, so Vans clearly had the license for the Pipe Master window, right? When World Surf League moved to January, I'm sure they wanted, not necessarily just because you can't, what I'm sure there would have been a way to Jimmy that to move it to January and still call it the Pipe Masters. Uh, Vans clearly said, no, we are keeping this event here. This is our event. This is our license. We're keeping it. You do your thing. We're keeping. By the way, we're going to run it right ahead of your event. Oh, and by the way, you're going to allow your surfers to surf in this, right? It's not a QS. It's not a, it's not on tour. It's a specialty event, but that was part of the, uh, uh, subtext, I suppose, is that CT surfers will be able to surf in that. Typically, you are not allowed to surf in an unsanctioned event. So World Surf League, in a absolute position of weakness, I mean, Vans would be like, okay, and then we'll, Vans doesn't even sponsor any events on tour. Imagine that. The shoe company that's making a billion dollars a year, one billion dollars a year, there's no Vans Pro anything, nothing. Vans does the Triple Crown, which... I suppose, do they sponsor Sunset? Is it the Van Sunset? No, I don't think it is, but they do sponsor the US Open, so a Challenger Series event. Sure, but like the by far wealthiest company, by far wealthiest company in our space, doesn't sponsor an event, tells the WSL, bend over, because we want to do this right now, and the WSL has to say, okay, even though they're not getting really anything in return. Well, again, the WSL painted themselves in a corner, and... Vans is producing a super compelling event. And the, if they, if the WSL said to their employees, to their surfers, you're not allowed to go over there and play with your friends in the way that you would actually prefer to play. You have to continue playing by our rules over here in our sandbox. It's a terrible look for the WSL. And I think a lot of the surfers are already questioning a lot of the WSL's actions. It's why they signed a petition this year to try to change some of the actions. And there's less and less incentive for John John, the, for Gabriel, for Kelly to continue playing by their rules. This is one more incentive. I mean, I hear you, except also the WSL could look out on the landscape and say, we don't see any live tour coming, right? There's no fans as, is notoriously stingy on, I think, paying for stuff besides their 10 pole stuff, you know, besides the U S open really in the space. Uh, it's not like Vans is going to go chat. So, okay, take this. We're not going to let our surfers in there. Uh, you run your thing. It'll be cute. You have a cute little thing and people like it. I'm sure it's cute. No, I, I mean, if I was the WSL, I would position in strength and then try to adjust the tour and make it better. I think it just looks just terrible keep... on the, the WSL. It'll look bad on them if they don't let those surfers go compete because to be perfectly honest, there's only three surfers that Vans would even want. They want John, John, they want Kelly, they want Gabriel. And we don't need any of your other guys. And by the way, if you don't let us have those three, who gives a crap? We've got Mason, we've got Jamie. We're going to invite Kai. I hear you. We're going to bring back Shane Dorian and Koa Rothman, Nathan Florence, Ivan Florence. Like we're going to create this crazy event that again, John, John, is desperate to come play in. If you don't let him, it only looks bad on you. Except for the fact that Kelly's 50, 
his time on tour is drawing to but a close anyway. He still wins the event. He won that event this year. I, for sure. And, and he's still a huge draw, I'm sure. I'm sure when Kelly's in the water or when Kelly's in an event or when Kelly is doing well in an event, WSL viewership numbers go up through the roof, right? Yeah. But yeah. I mean, again, we could talk about this all day, but I just don't understand why, sort of why the WSL just doesn't become its own live tour where, okay, you go do that, bands, whatever. Uh, we're going to reimagine our tour to make it better by cutting the field, by putting them, well, of course. you know, having it, ha like just do the stuff that would actually make it better instead of, yeah, like starting a new season again or the season ending. I suppose they, a lot of back backpats for this final five. I'm sure they'll start, I mean, it starts in six days, I think. I'm sure we'll hear a lot about how revolutionary and epic the World Surf League is for bringing this to us. Well, we will discuss that next week for sure. That'll mm -hmm. be the main focus of the show. Uh, but for now, let's go to commercial break. We're going to come back with more about Andy Lyon and then Barrel or Not to close out the show. Great. Chaz, of course, athleticgreens.com slash surf is always with us. They're always fueling the success of this show. Man, I've been on it again. Thanks to you. I was off it for a week. Just feeling bad, feeling rough. Not my usual self. You brought me that bag last week. Back on the bag, David Lee Scales. Good. And I emailed right them. Right as rain. I emailed them as well to get them to re-up all of our supplies. So wow. look forward to that. Um, of course, AG1 is how it's branded now, but athleticgreens.com slash surf is our portal. It's where you find optimal health. It only takes 30 seconds a day. You'll feel great. You cover all your nutrition, uh, dietary kind of gaps. Make sure that you get everything you need in one scoop with eight ounces of water. My uh, sister and, or I'm sorry, my sister, my wife's sister, her husband and young toddler son are staying here with us. Guess what toddler son loves? AG1.com slash surf. He gets Incredible. in there and loves it. And I watch him drink it and know boy's growing healthy. This boy, he's going to own the playground today. And whatever he ends up achieving in life in the future, you can take credit, partial credit for that uh, as well. I'm going to say like 75% credit. And he'll love you even more if you make a little smoothie out of that thing. Or make a smoothie with That's a banana, true. throw some uh, almond butter in there. It's delicious. Awesome. Well, athleticgreens.com slash surf. All right, Chaz, we are back. And um, boy, oh boy. Did I get some emails about uh, the Lil, Lil Anonymous and Angry TikToker? Oh, Lil TikToker. Um, Lil Anonymous. So, yeah. So do you want to hear from him? Yes, please. Did he call in again? He called in again. And boy, oh boy. Actually, before go. we go, before we go to him. I'm going to go to somebody else first. Hold on. Let me pull it up. This is great. I know it's a whole ongoing saga. I wasn't sure how we should actually, if we should even continue it, but we have to because uh, have lots to. of, lots of calls came in. So let's start with this one. Hey guys, this is Randy. Andy's twin brother, the smartest guy in Malibu surfing. Yeah. I mean, it was our idea. The whole thing was staged. We filmed it. We put it up there. Now we've tripled Andy's profile. There's people who never even knew about Andy who know about Andy. And we're TikToking our way all the way to the bank. I tell you, you know, he didn't get fired from his real estate agency. Are you kidding me? People are knocking down his door trying to get him to represent because they're like, if he's this aggressive on the wave, he's going to be twice as aggressive getting me the best deal in the market. Get barrel and keep up the work. Nice. Randy Lyon, not sure how to hang up his cell phone. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, the Lil Anonymous TikToker. You ready for it? I'm ready. I can't wait. Okay. Here we go. Hey, what's up, guys? Steve from Japan, apparent TikTok star. I had no idea. Uh, that was me who actually called, and uh, I, as I live in a completely different country and had no awareness as to who Andy Lyon was prior to you guys talking about him on three separate podcasts between four different hosts. I'm not sure what the total talk time was, but before that, I had no 
idea of even the existence of Andy Lyon or anyone involved in that story. And I've never once opened TikTok in my life or downloaded it. So I, I hate to bust the uh, your investigative journalism there, your sleuthing, but I am not the TikToker. And I also don't have any rage towards Andy whatsoever. If anything, the uh, the frustration I had in that call was towards you guys for your lack of journalistic abilities. Uh, and it's kind of funny. I'm not sure where to go with this, but you used one of the reasons why you thought it was the TikToker is the fact that I said his name right, Andy Lyon, and not Andy Lyons. And I thought it was pretty simple because you guys talked about him, and just out of curiosity, I just did a Google search and realized nothing came up. And I realized, oh, it's not actually Andy Lyons; it's Andy Lyon. And and realized that more information about the guy came up when I spelled his name correctly. And you'd think, as people who you may not consider yourself journalists, but people who are broadcasting news and events in the surfing world, that maybe the least you could have done is at least get the guy's name right. And then from there, maybe look into the story a little bit further. But uh, yeah, you didn't you didn't do that. And then I also like how in the call, by at the beginning of the call, you said, I think this is probably the TikToker. And by the end of the call, you were just assuming that I was the TikToker <laughs> and that my rage was towards Andy or that I had any rage at all. So I thought that was kind of kind of interesting. But again, goes back to my original point. That's okay if you guys don't think it's a story. Then pass on the story. Don't talk about it on three different podcasts between four different hosts and take Andy's word, you know, interview Andy, if you, again, if you can call it that for 30 minutes and talk about like whatever he said as if it was fact. Like if it's no story, then it's no story. Then don't talk about it. And if you guys want to talk about it, if you're a journalist or not, let's just look at the definition of journalism here, which is a person who writes for newspapers, magazines, or news websites or prepares news to be broadcast. I think that if you guys are just sitting around on your sofa or sitting around in a van by the fucking beach talking about random surf stuff, I think that you're you're certainly not journalists. But the moment you broadcast it with the intention of getting a wider audience every day, and then money also gets involved where you're getting sponsorships and that, I think you guys are journalists. But again, the, the reason why I didn't, leave or the reason why my number is unrecognized is because I'm calling from overseas from Skype. Uh, and the reason why I didn't leave my name was because, well, I didn't really think it was necessary or pertinent to the conversation. But as I hear you guys continue to talk about the TikToker, I realized that maybe the real story was who is the TikToker? Who is this guy who added Andy? What's his history with Andy? What was anything like that? So again, maybe Andy was just some disgruntled asshole in the lineup who completely unprovoked through a board or through a rock or some guy's board that may be the case if that is the case i think there is a story there and maybe andy should be taken out of the lineup and put in handcuffs for a certain period of time but maybe the real story is who who is this tiktoker and why is he you know apparently without the permission of the guy who got his board smashed why is he out here making this viral video to try and make andy look awful whether justified or not so i don't know i think maybe that maybe that's the story maybe Maybe this is a good time to try and hone in that uh, journalistic integrity and uh, actually look into it and get some details right. But for for the time being, maybe just start saying Andy's name correctly. That'd be a good start. So good luck with that. See you guys. We're bad at what we do. Uh, well, I'll I'll tell you where I am with Steve. Leaving four minute rants on people's voicemails is space strictly reserved for our mothers when we were eighteen years old. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> you are not allowed to do it. <laughs> My mom. I mean, it was the original form of podcasting was me having to listen to those rants when I was in my teenage years because I wasn't answering her calls. Okay. That's who that's reserved for, not Steve. But thanks anyways. Um, Let's get to actual barrel and awe. We already covered barrel and awe number one, which was exercising restraint. So we'll go to barrel and awe number two, which is straight from the arc or the uh, Instagram of Idolo. Framing photos of yourself in your finest moments and hanging them on your own wall. I mean, this could not be any less barrel for me. Uh, I will give you one or two, right? I will give you in your home, your living space, one or two of your moments. Oh, heck, kind of depends on how much stuff you have there, right? Like I have my own books on my bookshelf. In the garage, there's a somewhere, I think, a giant blown up 
poster of Welcome to Paradise, Now Go to Hell uh, in the garage. I think turned backwards, if I recall. Um, there is on the bookshelf a couple film awards that I've won. And I'm going to say that's about it. And so in that range, I think is okay, right? Uh, I'm going to say less than 10% of your total home decor can be allowed, I'm going to say 5% of your total home decor can be dedicated to you and your accomplishments. Italo, in his home, for those who haven't seen the video, him skating around is 100%. There's not one thing in there that's not Italo. It's a museum to Italo. How bizarre is it? There's his trophies. There's his framed jerseys. There is his framed photos of his best moments blown up poster size. And that's it. There's not one uh, live, laugh, love little <laughs> hanging. There is no, not one anything. I'm sure if you could look at the, or if we could see, I don't even remember if there was a coffee table. If there was, I guarantee it is filled with magazines with Italo on the cover. Yeah, I wasn't bothered by the jersey, wasn't even bottled, bothered by the uh, trophies. Then it pans to photos of him surfing. And I'm like, okay, it's, it's, I like a good surf photo, but it's a photo of yourself. Then it pans to just photos of him, not necessarily surfing. <laughs> this is like a la, you know, Real Housewife of Beverly Hills with a painting of herself posing, you know, a giant eight by eight foot by 10 foot on her living room wall. Like it's incredibly it, narcissistic. And like it, you said, it, it's overwhelming. It, it looked like a scene out of Zoolander. Like it truly totally. looked like he was the new bad male model uh, who was coming to take over. Fully, entirely. So I'm okay with framing moments of your finest moments or framing images or relics of your finest moments. I stop at photos of yourself and it has to be just you by yourself because maybe it's a photo of your wedding day. That's fine because that's about your wife or your partner. Maybe it's a photo of your kid, your kid, you know, being born and that's about them. But if you are the explicit subject of the photo can't hang it. The, and the sole subject of the photo. Right. The yeah. only one. Yeah. I mean, so we're, we're going bizarre. Bizarre. We're going Zero now. barrel. Sorry. Sorry, Eagle. This is the world we live in, by, by the way, nowadays. The I mean, narcissistic I, what, world that we live in. It really was a snapshot into Eagle's mind where I think somebody commented, I think I posted the video on uh, Instagram. My Instagram. And uh, yeah, somebody commented about Edel used to be the surfer of the people, and now he's this, where it felt accurate. It felt like an accurate assessment of Edelo being frothy and about surfing and da 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 da. And now Edelo is about Edelo, which seems like wow. it's been a bummer turn all year. That's a great, great point. Uh, final barrel or nah, I just mentioned the Real Housewives of Beverly Hills, but final barrel or nah, watching drama based reality TV. And this actually is surf related because Derek just wrote a story that there's a new show on Netflix called Selling the OC. And it features one Tyler St uh, Stanlin. And Tyler has been a standout surfer in Orange County for 15 years, surfs the wedge, does big airs, turns out to be unbelievably handsome, met a Hollywood celebrity female a decade ago, married her. Uh, is her name Brittany Snow? I think so. Yeah, I think so too. So he met this girl, Brittany Snow, and now he's living kind of this, I mean, he was already living the dream life. Now he's living a Hollywood dream life. And apparently he's also a realtor and he's now featured on this um, Netflix show. So there's a previous show that they made called Selling Sunset. Never inclined to watch that. Not inclined to watch a lot of this drama-based reality TV, but Derek has written a story that's been a compelling pitch to me. I'm inclined to push play. What do I do? Uh, so funny enough, funny enough, uh, yesterday I was flipping through Netflix and I, you know how you s like hover over the thing and it'll play a extended trailer or a part of the show or whatever. I found myself unable to move beyond the extended trailer. Like I just left it hovering there and I was watching and I was watching 
and I was watching until it ended. I would have sat there and probably watched the whole episode if it would have allowed me in like, you know, uh, picture in picture form, which says to me, there's something in my heart that's crying out for. It. Yeah. I, I would have thought I was going to say barrel. I know. And I'm, I'm kind of inclined to click play. I mean, it's sexy people. It's high in real estate. So there's a bunch of dollars trading hands. And the fact that he's a local surfer who I've seen surfing in the water a ton of times over the last decade or so, I kind of, I'm kind of, I think I might push play. And it's going to be gross too. There's going to be like that fun kind of where, you know, we all like to feel better than who we're watching. Um, did you and I talk about that? The whole no. point of social media is to, like, somebody tell me this recently, can't remember who, but the whole point of social media basically is for you to feel better than everyone. It's you can look at everybody's drunken, bad, whatever, or uh, not, not just social media, but like celebrity social media, reality kind of, you know, these, these stars. So you can look at the Kardashians and think, ah, you know, I would never get myself into a spot like Khloe Kardashian. Right. Uh, look at how dumb she is, right? Look at how, oh, I think I heard this on a podcast, I guess, when I was driving to Tennessee. Anyhow, all to say, uh, agreed with the sentiment. And to me, this kind of selling OC kind of thing where you watch it and you say, these super rich people, blah, blah, blah. I'm better than all of them. Cool. I'm going to push play. I want to feel better. Do it. Do it. Um, I think that's the bonus you get. On a side note, um, on the previous show, Selling Sunset, one of the characters, her name's Christine or Christina. She's like this bombshell blonde who looks like Barbie because she also looks plastic. She and I connected on Hinge before Lauren and I met. Oh, did you go on a date? No, she vetted me so quickly. Like she was asking all these questions. I did not meet her criteria. Like she connected with me based on, I, I don't know, like the little dating profile, you know? But as soon as she like realized, actually literally realized I didn't own a boat is when she was That was it. Man, so do you think, uh, how much did being a surf podcaster affect your desirability? I did not tell her I was a surf podcaster. I told her I worked in the surf industry and uh, she realized quickly what that meant, which is I don't make enough money. And so her literally her follow-up question was, do you own a boat? And I was like, what? Like, no. Why? Like, how, well, I, how- I, was con- I was confused, you know? And I was like, no, what, what is, she goes, oh, anyways, I'm looking for somebody who owns a boat, but good luck out there. And I was like- What if, what if she would have said yes? Well, then she would have asked how big is the boat? Sure. But then you said, I mean, you think about it and think, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to get a buddy's boat uh, 60 feet. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that she is very good at vetting. So I'm sure that she would have figured me out real quick. And, but the funny thing about it was she looked superficial based on the photos. So I wasn't surprised. I was only offended like for five seconds. And then I actually admired her because just being way um, upfront with what she wants. 100%. This person is on a dating app, which is already superficial, a superficial way, you know, in a lot of ways to meet people. And, but she wants what she wants. She's not wasting any time. So why not just explicitly state your criteria? There's no sense in, she's connecting with a hundred people a day, I'm sure. So you can't go on a hundred dates in the course of a week. So let's kind of call through this and I'll reserve four nights a week to go on dates with these people. But at least I know that when I'm on the date with those people, they earn a million dollars a year because that's important to me. Yeah. Smart. Good job. I know. Hilarious. But it turns out apparently she is the absolute villain on the show. And so I think it was smart that she weeded me out. So I didn't have to spend my time with her. Maybe except for, did you watch the Manti Teo uh, untold story thing? I I mean, you could have, you could have catfished her in a sort of, it would have been amusing to you to pretend rich and really string her along as long as you could by, by pretending to be super wealthy. You know, maybe you'd rent a, a Ferrari the days you go to hang out, right? Like, like it would be expensive, but it would be really, really funny. I think that's, a, it could have become a podcast series that could have been gold. Yep. Missed opportunity. A, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
now it's really messed. Got a kid. Hey, hey, Lauren, I'm going to be downloading Hinge again. It's for a podcast project. <laughs> Don't ask any questions. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, we covered a lot of ground this show. Uh, hopefully, I mean, through the discussion of violence and surf violence that's taking place, hopefully we've inspired some um, peace. I hope the people, the listeners, were inspired by the violence that was happening to the trees in the yard while they listened to a podcast about violence. It wasn't that loud, actually, on my end. No. It kept on, like, branches kept falling on the roof here, just scaring me each and every time. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, great show. Uh, can't wait to see you next week. Anything else that you want to advertise in the meantime? Um, I think we totally blew advertising the Florida Surf Film Festival last week, so we don't we need did. to do that. They sold out. Uh, they didn't need us anyway. They, they sold out. Yeah. Of course they didn't. Of course they didn't. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I'm good. All right, sweet. Beachgrit.com, surfsplendorpodcast.com. Somebody's going to win that Panda Shiitake today. I have all the names, but I haven't rolled the uh, roulette wheel yet. So we'll do that well, uh, this afternoon. Will, will the po podcast go live before you spin the wheel? I think so. Okay, so if you're listening right now, if you're listening and not a subscriber, imagine how good that would feel to hear the end of the show, subscribe, just five bucks a month, nothing, pocket change. I mean, but very, very appreciated here. Uh, you subscribe, 10 minutes later, you win the Panda Shiitake. It's almost like destiny. Yeah, I feel if you subscribe today, the winner is going to be somebody who subscribes today, saying it now. I agree. Trust it's in like us. Kanoa, Kanoa getting that wave at Chopu in the final seconds yep. to make the final five. Yep. Equally as compelling and dramatic. All right, Chaz, until next week. Bon voyage.